Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Anatomy and Physiology. As you guys know, I'm Professor Bob Long. These videos are being done because we're in the coronavirus shutdown. If you're watching them, you're either enrolled in my class or stumbled across them on YouTube. If you're in my class, learn this. This is for my Part 1 A&P course. If you're not in my class, learn the information the way your instructor wants to. If this helps you, please hit like and subscribe and you'll continue to get my videos. Now, if you are in my class, we're working in the notes set and I don't actually have a note set on me. I actually don't carry notes, I just lecture. But we're on the beginning of Unit 2, the tissue level of organization. And I've already gone over essentially the first page of notes. Again, I don't know which page that is but um, uh, in the note set, but it's the first page that has the definitions of epithelium, connective tissue, muscle tissue, talks about the functions of epithelial tissue, cell adhesion molecules, and the two layers of the basement membrane. I've already done that in a previous lecture. We're going to pick up on the next page and we're going to talk about the classification of epithelia, which we've kind of already done as well. Um, and then we're going to start talking about the locations and functions of all the epithelia that are written in the note set for you. So, let me pull a chair over so I can have somewhere to set my stuff in case I need to reach for it. Now, um, so we are on the second lecture test information. We're covering uh, tissues all together. You should know the four major tissues of the human body, epithelium, connective muscle, and neural, and the basic function of each, and all the details that we've gone over on the first page about epithelial tissue. It is, um, covers and lines surfaces of the body, it's avascular, it has a basement membrane. The basement membrane has two separate layers, the lamina lucida and the lamina densa. You should know the description of each and the function of each. You should also know what cell adhesion molecules are. Now, we're on to the next page, and we've already kind of covered this. How we classify epithelia is based on two words in the name. The name is usually blank, blank epithelium or epithelial tissue. And as we said in the previous video, the first word tells you how many layers of epithelium there are between the basement membrane and the outside world. If the word is simple, it's a single layer of cells. If the word is stratified, then there's two or more layers of cells, multiple layers. Could be two, could be 20, could be 400, okay? The second word in the name we said tells you the shape of the cells. And there were three basic shapes that we looked at. Squamous, which are flat cells, very thin, the thinnest cells in the human body. Um, cuboidal, which are cube-shaped cells, they're like little cubes, three-dimensional cubes that have a centrally located nucleus and columnar, which are long, tall, thin cells that have an elongated nucleus, okay? Now, each one of those shapes can come in either simple or stratified. There's simple squamous, stratified squamous epithelium. There's simple cuboidal and stratified cuboidal, simple columnar, stratified columnar. There are two other tissues that we could talk about. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on one of them called stratified, I'm sorry, called um, transitional epithelium. You should look up transitional epithelium and read about it. And then there's pseudostratified pseudo ciliated columna. So the top of the next page we've already gone over, which is how do we name the tissues and what does the name mean? What we need to get into is where do we find these tissues in the body and what is their function in that particular location? Before I get into that, one last thing. There's kind of a simple rule of thumb, okay? We find simple epithelium is found where we want permeability. We tend to find simple epithelia where we want things to pass through. I mean, think about a football team running out on a Friday night when we used to have the paper stuff. Now they have the big blow up things. But we used to always have a big banner that the football players would run through and break through. It was made out of paper. Why didn't we make it out of cardboard? Why don't you make it out of thicker substances? Because you couldn't pass through very easily. So the thinner the membrane, the easier it is for things to pass through. If someone spilled some um, you know, Kool-Aid or some, some dyed material on a napkin, it's going to soak right through or on a tablecloth. If you spilled it on a memory foam bed and you were looking for the, through the, from the other side, it would take a long time for it to permeate and it may not make it all the way through. So we want simple epithelia, simple squamous, simple cuboidal, simple columnar, where we want things to pass into and out. And as a general rule of thumb, we find stratified epithelia 
where we want protection. We want thick layers where we want protection. You know, the thicker it is, if I were going to throw a baseball and told you I'm going to hit you with the baseball, would you want a sheet or would you want a pillow covering you? The thicker the layers, the more padding, the more protection from abrasion and scratches and scrapes. So as a general rule of thumb, if you don't know where a tissue, if you can't recall when you're thinking about the test, think about this. If it's simple, we want things to go in and out. If it's stratified, we want protection, okay? So now let's start running through the list of tissues that are in the note set, okay? Not all of the tissues that are in the textbook are we gonna discuss. I, I wanna focus on a few and the remainder we will come to in a later date. Now, um, one of the things that I want you to know is for simple epithelia, it is probably the most complex as far as where we find it and what its functions are. For simple squamous epithelium, okay? And this is already written mostly in the note set, but simple squamous epithelial tissue. If you think about it, if I have some basement membrane here and I have a connective tissue underneath, a big thick layer of some kind of connective tissue, then between the basement membrane and the outside world, I have a single thin layer of these flat cells. And if I were to look down on top of them, they would look like this, with their little nucleus in the center, all connected to each other, all the way across this basement membrane. So we want simple epithelia, where we want permeability, but it serves a second function, and that is um, it sort of provides, it provides protection in the sense that it provides somewhat of a, it decreases friction. So when we talk about the functions of simple epithelia, there are two functions. One is permeability. So we're going to find it in a few spots of the body where we want things to pass through very easily. The second function is it will decrease friction. And this would be in what we call the serous membranes. That's one of the locations that we find it. So I'm gonna do this one first. The membranes, if you recall in the laboratory, we talked about the organs in the ventral body cavity. Those organs are rubbing on each other. If you rub your hands together for a long time, they start to get hot, you'll rub skin off, and they become rather raw and chafed. But if I could take a thin, wet membrane, like a slip and slide, and put one on either hand, then they would slide across each other. And if this were an organ, and this is the wall of the cavity, then I would have a visceral pleura and a parietal pleura, if I were talking about the lungs, or the visceral pericardium, which touches the surface of the heart, and the parietal pericardium, which is lining the wall of the cavity. So let's just look at a lung, for example. If I'm looking at the thoracic cavity like this, and there's a pipe that comes in and goes into your lungs, and there's a big muscle across here. On the surface of the lung, I will have a thin layer of simple squamous epithelium. That same membrane will fold back and line the walls of the cavity and do this on either lung. And of course, the layer that is touching the surface of the lung would be the visceral pleura. And the outer layer would be called the parietal pleura. We've covered that in lab. And now it's on your first lab test. Those serous membranes reduce friction so that the organs glide across each other, okay? Another place that we can find simple squamous epithelium where it reduces friction is that it lines the heart chambers. It will line the chambers of the heart, okay? Now, your blood cells, your red blood cells and white blood cells are being shot around your body by your heart. When your heart pumps, it squeezes your fluid called blood with all these cells in it all the way around the pipes of the body back to the heart. So those red blood cells and those white blood cells are bumping into each other and into the walls of the vessel, kind of like the walls of a racetrack. If you ever watch a car race, especially something like NASCAR where they're riding next to each other, Sometimes people rub each other and they bump the wall. If you look at the cars at the beginning of the race, they're nice and pretty and beautiful. At the end of the race, they look like hell. They look like they've been beat up because they bump into each other in the wall. 
So imagine if we lined the walls with a nice thin coating of something slick so that they just glided across the wall. Or if they pulled into a garage, the garage, if they all had to drive through a building, then that whole building would be lined with something slick. Well, that building would be the chambers of the heart. When your heart, the empty chambers of your heart contract, the blood cells will be squirted through there, through the blood vessels back to that chamber. So we find simple squamous epithelium lining the chambers of the heart where it also reduces friction. And there's a third place that we will find it and it also lines the blood vessels. It will line the walls of our blood vessels. So there's three places at least that we find simple squamous epithelium where it's going to reduce friction. We find it in serous membranes, lining the chambers of the heart, and lining the walls of blood vessels, okay? And all three places it reduces friction. Now, since this membrane is between this and the wall, between an organ and the wall, or it's in the middle, the word middle is meso. So the serous membranes are sometimes referred to as a mesothelium. If you ever see the commercials, uh, you work in a shipyard, blah, 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 you have mesothelioma, call 1-800, blah, 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 we'll sue everybody. Well, mesothelioma is a tumor, an oma, of the mesothelium, of some, sometimes of these membranes. So these serous membranes are also referred to as a mesothelium because they're in the middle instead of an epithelium. And because these areas, the chambers of the heart and the blood vessels, the lining is on the inside of the vessel. These are sometimes referred to as an endothelium. So, so far, simple squamous epithelium, we know the functions. Permeability, and it reduces friction. There's three places it reduces friction. Serous membranes, also referred to as a mesothelium, lining the heart and the blood vessels as an endothelium. All three reduce friction. Now. The last place I want to point it out is where it actually functions for permeability. And where it functions for permeability is it lines what we call the alveoli of the lungs. And I know it's probably hard to read when you're reading your screen and it's all crooked, so let me rewrite that. It lines what we call the alveoli and the alveoli are known as the air sacs of the lungs. So, I want you to think about this for a second. If you had a plastic grocery bag, I know there's a big ban on plastic and blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't want to get into any of that stuff. But if you took a single plastic grocery bag that you bring home from groceries, from the grocery store, like here we have HEB or Walmart or Target. If you were to jump off a building with a single bag as a parachute, you would fall straight to the ground and hurt yourself because it doesn't catch enough air. Now, if I could take two of those bags and glue one side together so that they are both catching air, and I did that on all sides so that maybe I had a thousand of these things, now they could catch a lot of air, they might break my fall like a parachute. Well, each individual bag represents what we call an alveolus excuse me, an alveolus. We'll see this term when we talk about the lungs. Alveolus or alveolus is an air sac. It's singular. If you see me write it as alveoli, that is air sacs. That's plural, okay? So the alveoli of the lungs, the air sacs of the lungs, are lined with simple squamous epithelium, literally like this. So let me show you. If I took some simple squamous cells and I put them into a little U-shape almost, and then I had another simple squamous cell here next to another one, and another set here. And they're all back to back making these little air sacs. If I blow air in this way, it's gonna catch or get caught in all of these. And right on the surface, on the undersurface, is a modified uh, basement membrane. And right up against that is going to be some blood vessels. This red marker doesn't work very well. This one's probably too dark, but I'm going to use it anyway. I have a little blood vessel that's running along here called a capillary. And it turns out that this capillary's walls are also a single squamous cell thick. 
So now I have one squamous cell up against another squamous cell. And the air can go, the oxygen in the air, O2 is oxygen. Oxygen is water sol is lipid soluble and water soluble. And it will dissolve right through the air sac into our bloodstream. And then the oxygen goes to our tissues to make energy. Let me erase that and redo it. And when the tissues consume the oxygen, they spit out carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide will go into our bloodstream and get delivered back to our lungs. So the carbon dioxide, and I'm gonna change the color for CO2 so that we can see the movement. The CO2 will be exhaled. So when you inhale atmospheric air, you're inhaling all the oxygen, it gets absorbed through the thin walls, the simple squamous epithelium of the alveoli of the lungs into our bloodstream. We deliver the oxygen to our tissues, the tissues release carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide can pass right through the simple squamous epithelium, increase permeability in the alveoli of the lungs. So, we are done with simple squamous epithelium for now. You need to know the four locations. It's found lining the alveoli of the lungs or the air sacs for permeability to allow the gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide to permeate. It is found in the serous membranes to reduce friction between the organs and the cavity walls. It is found in lining the blood vessels and our heart to reduce friction, okay? Those are the major areas that we find simple squamous epithelium. Those are the functions, got it? Good. We're gonna move on to the next one on the list, and I have stratified squamous epithelium listed next. So let me erase all of this, and we'll do stratified squamous epithelial tissues. Now remember, a minute ago I told you we have stratified epithelium where we want protection, and that's exactly it. So stratified squamous epithelium. The two things you need to know. Where is its location? It is found in the dermis of the skin. Sorry, it's found in the epidermis of the skin, my bad. The uppermost layer is stratified squamous. The dermis we've said in lab is the connective tissues. But the epidermis is thick with lots of layers so that if I scratch my skin, if something scrapes me, it doesn't get down into the blood vessels down below and open me up and make me susceptible for effect, infections and things. So we find it in the epidermis of the skin. The function of it is protection. And it's protection against a number of things. Abrasion. And abrasion is when you scrape yourself, like if you fall down and skin your knee. Other physical damage. Abrasion is one of them, but pinches and scrapes and rubs and cuts. It's protection against harmful chemicals, like acids and bases. And other harmful chemicals. If you pour some, some toxins on your skin, a lot of times they won't get absorbed. Some are, that's why you need to read the label of chemicals, but some of them will run right off your body and cannot permeate through the stratified squamous. And, um, oh, it's protection against pathogens. It's known as the first line of defense in our body's defense mechanisms. Okay, so our body has a defense mechanism, your immune system. But before your immune system can attack something and eliminate it, it has to penetrate through the, the epidermis of your skin. So that's where we find it. Now, there's different types of stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, so I wanna mention these two. If you see the term non Keratinized. Non keratinized lines the mouth, the rectum, the vagina, and the urethra. Okay? 
and lines some of the tubes that run through the body, but only the beginnings of the tubes. So if I stick my finger in my mouth, there's stratified squamous lining the walls, but it's non-keratinized and it's very moist. Keratin is a protein in skin that makes it very tough and dry and, and somewhat rigid. It's not keratinized stratified squamous in our mouth or in the rectum or in the opening of the vagina or the urethra where urine comes out. We want those membranes not dry and crispy and hard. That would be very uncomfortable and itchy. We want that stuff moist so it's non-keratinized. There's another type of stratified squamous epithelium called keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and that is found in the epidermis of the skin. But think of it on the outside where you can actually reach in and touch without sticking your finger in an orifice or an opening, okay? So, stratified squamous epithelium is in the epidermis of the skin its function is protection against abrasion, physical damage, chemicals, harmful chemicals, and pathogens like bacteria and virus and, and things that can cause pathology. There's a keratinized found in the epidermis, and there's non-keratinized found in the openings of the body, okay? So now, we're done with stratified squamous epithelium. I hope you have that down. Let me check one thing on my camera. Yeah, everything's within the frame, good. Um, now we got a couple more tissues to do for, for epithelia, and then we'll end this video and start another one for another subject, okay? So now, <clears throat> once we're done with that, there's only a few more that we're gonna talk about. The next tissue we're gonna talk about is called simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. The single layers of cube-shaped cells. The main location that we find it we find it in two locations. One is it lines several different glands. And the function there is it does secretion. If I could spell correctly. So the function of many of our glands is to secrete fluids. And we find a lot of simple cuboidal epithelium in several of the glands. Examples would be like the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland has lots of little follicles or bundles of cells that are like a hollow ball filled with fluid. That fluid that is secreted there is from these simple cuboidal epithelium. There's a second location, and we find it in the kidney tubules. Now our kidneys are where we're trying to get rid of toxins that are developed from a lot of the chemistry of our body. So when, when our kidneys are, are, when we run blood through our kidneys, our kidneys filter our blood. They take out the good stuff and the bad stuff. They put the good stuff back into our blood and let the bad stuff out in urine so it cleans your blood. Otherwise your blood would fill up with toxins and poison you to death. That's why ki kidney failure is lethal. It's almost like if you lived on a lake that didn't have any outflow to any other bodies of water and you pour poison in it just a little bit every day, over time, that lake would become so poisonous that everything in it would be killed, like all the fish or if you drink from it. The same is true with your blood. When our cells are consuming nutrients, they're dumping waste into the surrounding fluids. That waste goes into our blood, and the toxin levels in your blood build up. Your blood becomes septic. I don't know if you've ever heard this term, but you may have heard the term. Here, let me write it over here. Septic or sepsis. Well, if you know what a septic tank is, that's where all the trash goes when you flush the toilet on a farm or something. So when you have sepsis, that means the tissue is filled with toxins and it's poisoning the surrounding cells and stuff. So in our kidney tubules, we're going to pull a lot of trash out of our blood. We're going to be absorbing it and then getting it out of the body. So in the kidney tubules, it will do both absorption and secretion. And that's for getting rid of toxins and reabsorbing nutrients and things, but it's to prevent sepsis and to, to maintain nutrients. You don't really need to know that part, but it's interesting to think about. So simple cuboidal epithelium is found in two places. It lines glands for secretion. It's found in kidney tubules for absorption and secretion of many substances. That's all that you need to know. So we're done with that one for now. Trying to keep it real simple. We'll add complexity as time goes on, okay? 
The next one I want to talk about is simple columnar epithelium. And the reason we are not going to talk about stratified cuboidal is stratified cuboidal is pretty rare in the body, as is stratified columnar. So we're not even going to touch those right now. But for simple columnar epithelial tissue, sorry, I dropped my pen lid. Simple columnar epithelium is really found in one location. It lines most of the digestive tract. The function is absorption. Okay? So think about this. If I try to draw a little person here, here's your digestive tract where food goes in, here's your stomach. And then the digestive tract folds up on itself, but essentially it makes one large tube. That tube, we're gonna put stuff in one end, it's gonna come out the other. Now, if you think about it, in the beginning and at the end of the tube, in the mouth and a little bit of, the, of what we call the pharynx, where we first swallow, and the rectum, we have stratified squamous. So I'm just gonna put strat squamous there and there. We have stratified squamous epithelium at the beginning. If you swallow popcorn or a Dorito or something, it's going to scrape the walls. Or if you got popcorn stuck in your throat, you're all <sighs> you're scratching the walls. You want stratified squamous there. When things come sliding out the other end, you want stratified squamous, okay? Because, you, you know, certain things you eat don't get digested, and you see it later on swimming around. Well, that stuff is scraping the walls. You want stratified squamous. But most of the middle of the digestive tract is gonna all be simple columnar. All the way in between that, it's almost entirely simple columnar epithelium. So that all the nutrients that we digest as it passes through this tube get absorbed into our bloodstream. So its number one function is absorption. Now, there are a few modified columnar cells that can secrete a little bit of mucus called goblet cells. I'm not worried about those right now. Okay, so now we've covered four of the different types of epithelial tissues. Simple squamous, stratified squamous, simple cuboidal, simple columnar. You need to know the location and the function of each. And that's about it. There's one more that we did not talk about in lab that I'm going to discuss now. And I mentioned it possibly in lab, but I did not go into the details because we didn't look at it on the slide. This one's got a crazy name, so pay attention. This one is called pseudo. The word pseudo, or the root pseudo or prefix means false or fake. It's called pseudo stratified. This means layers. Ciliated means they have cilia on them. Remember, cilia are the long membrane extensions that keep things moving. Columnar epithelial tissue. So, pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. This is a really important one, so you should know it, okay? And there's essentially one place that we find it, okay? The location is it lines most of the upper respiratory tract. Most of our upper respiratory tract, okay? And there's some in the lower respiratory tract as well. And part of what we call the respiratory tree, okay? Its function is twofold. One, it can secrete mucus, which is snot, mucus, from what we call goblet cells. And there are some mucus glands associated with it, but goblet cells will coat the respiratory tract with mucus, and I'll show you what I mean in a second. Its second function is that it helps remove debris to protect the respiratory 
exchange surface. And that respiratory exchange surface is the alveoli. Now this tissue is not found in the alve alveoli, it's found in the tubes that lead to it, okay? So pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. So let me explain something to you. I'll talk a little bit more about this, and then we'll be done with this, these tissues for now. If I could look at a basement membrane somewhere in the human body, and I were to look at a layer of tissue, the free edge is far away, the cells all come down like this, then I would see nuclei like this. We know that would be simple columnar epithelium. Outside world, basement membrane, single layer of columnar cells. Or in some places of the body, I'm not gonna connect these because they don't end up in the same spot. In a rare occasion, we might see this. That would be stratified columnar epithelium. The definition of a simple epithelium is this, a tissue in which, it's an epithelial tissue in which all of the cells are in direct contact with the basement membrane or basal lamina. In stratified uh, epithelials, uh, epithelia, only the basal layer is attached to the basement membrane, all the other layers are not. So only one layer of the cells is in contact with the basement membrane and there are multiple layers. Now. If I were to look at it under a microscope at this tissue, what I would see is a basement membrane. What I would see is, here's the free edge of cells, and the cells are so crammed together that some of them have their nucleus pushed up, and some of them have their nucleus pushed down. So it would look like this if I saw the rows of nuclei. I might have a nucleus here and here and there and there and there and there and one pushed up here. So it looks like there's multiple layers of nuclei. But if you can look at it with a really good microscope, every cell really is touching the basement membrane. So it's not quite simple columnar. It's not quite stratified columnar. So they called it pseudostratified columnar epithelium. It really is a simple epithelial tissue, but they don't call it that. Now, at the ends of these cells are these long membrane extensions called cilia. And every now and then, one of these cells becomes somewhat modified, and they get really big up at the top and fill with mucus. That green marker is not working, so let me find another one. They get filled with mucus and they secrete this mucus onto the surface. And of course, some of these other cells would be squeezed in here like this. So every now and then in this tissue, while it looks like multiple layers, it's not. They're all ciliated, but the whole surface of the tissue is covered with mucus. And the cell that secretes the mucus is called a goblet cell. A goblet is a, like a wine glass. They're thick on top and skinny on the bottom. So they called them goblet cells because they look like a wine goblet, so to speak. Goblet cells secrete mucus that coats the surface. Got it? So pseudostratified ciliate columnar epithelium lines most of the upper respiratory tract and part of the respiratory tree, which is part of the lower respiratory tract. Here's what I mean. I'm gonna erase this language here, and I wanna show you something. The opening where we put food in, the mouth, and the opening where we're supposed to breathe is connected, the nose, is connected to the oral cavity where our mouth is, and they share a tube for a little ways. Eventually this tube will branch off, and one part goes to our stomach. This would be the digestive tract. But one of those tubes actually branches forward. I'm gonna change the color for it. It comes down, and then our lungs would be here. That's our respiratory system. And the respiratory and digestive systems share a common tube. So we can breathe air in and out this way, okay? Now, if I were to look at the lungs from an anterior view from the front, they would look like this. I would have a lung here, 
and the lungs sitting next to it, a right and left lung. They are not equal in size, but we're not going to get into that. I would have some tubes that come out and then go up to the opening where the mouth is. And then these tubes are going to branch and branch and branch and branch and branch. And it really ends up looking like an upside down tree with the trunk and all the branches. And at the ends of those branches would be the alveoli for which we breathe in. Remember, the alveoli are a single layer of squamous cells. Now, in the outside world, I don't know if you've ever done this, but if you've ever taken the air conditioning filter out of your air AC at your house, if you have central heat and air, and if you don't do that, you should know that your AC has a filter in it. When you take that sucker out and look at it after a couple of months, it looks like someone sucked a herd of cats through there. There's fuzz and fur and dirt and debris, and no air can get through. If you don't change it, it will stop airflow through your AC, and your AC will shut down. So you have to take that air filter out, throw it away, and grab another one and put it in, and it will filter the air. Well, that's kind of what the lungs are doing. As we inhale oxygen, it lets the oxygen into our bloodstream, but it filters out all the other trash. Now, where did all the particulate matter, all that dirt and dust and debris in your AC filter come from? It's blowing around in all the air that we breathe. And as we're breathing in that air, we don't want that to clog up our lungs. We can't take the lungs out, throw them away, and put new ones in. We can. There's lung transplants, but they're very difficult, very dangerous. And it's hard to find someone who has healthy lungs that'll fit in your body with the exact same blood type and genetic makeup. So it's not real possible. So Mother Nature coated the entire respiratory tree with mucus. Not all of it, but most of it in the upper part. And all the way up from here into the oral cavity and the nasal cavity are all coated with mucus. And when you breathe dirt and dust and debris in, that partic particulate matter will whirl, whirl around and get trapped in the mucus. And the cilia in the walls here are all pushing upwards towards the opening. And as they push that dirt and debris up, it will tickle your throat and you go <clears throat> spit it out or swallow it, gets it out of the respiratory tract, or you sneeze it out when it tickles way up here and you sneeze that stuff out, that's getting the debris back out so it does not clog up your lungs and cause emphysema. So that's where we find pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. It lines the upper respiratory tract and parts of the respiratory tree. It secretes mucus but its main function is protection by moving the mucus up so that we can get the trash out. And they call that movement of the mucus upwards the mucus escalator, or some books call it the mucus elevator, but it's the same difference. So pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Looks like multiple layers of cells, but it's not. It's a single layer. It has cilia, and there are goblet cells mixed in which secrete mucus, which coats most of our respiratory tract so that we can push dirt and debris out, okay? Now, those are the five epithelial tissues I want you to know. Know the location and function of all five. Simple squamous had several locations and functions. The others were pretty straightforward. I hope that made sense to you. I hope you had as much fun learning this as I did teaching it. And I hope that you do this till you can't stand it, do it till you understand it, and then do it five more times. Keep writing them out. Write out all five, just work on the locations, then work on the functions, or however you wanna do it. But you have to do it over and over and over and over again until you can walk in and tell someone, did you know there's five types of epithelial tissues that are on our test? Simple squamous, stratified squamous, simple cuboidal, simple columnar, pseudo-stratified ciliated columnar. This one's found here, this one's found here. You should be able to do it like I just did it without looking at your notes. If you can't, you have some work to do. Again, I hope you had as much fun as I did. I'll see you on the flip side in the next video. Thanks for watching.